So, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, bis jetzt, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, einen wunderschönen guten Abend. Ich darf Sie hier ganz herzlich begrüßen zu unserer Zeitzeugenveranstaltung 70 Jahre danach, genau heute vor 70 Jahren, am 20. November 1945, begannen die Hauptkriegsverbrecherprozesse hier in diesem Raum. Ein Ort der Geschichte und heute, ganz speziell heute natürlich auch ein Datum der Geschichte. Ich begrüße ganz herzlich aus dem Konsularischen Chor Herrn Generalkonsul Sergej Ganja aus Russland, der Russischen Republik. Ich begrüße den stellvertretenden Generalkonsul Pierre Robillon aus Frankreich. Ich begrüße ganz herzlich Herrn Botschafter Stephen Rapp, ehemaliger Sonderbotschafter der USA für Kriegsverbrechen. Als Moderator freue ich mich, er ist ein Freund unseres Hauses, Herrn Professor John Barrett gewonnen zu haben und ihn zu begrüßen von der St. John's School of Law. Und dann kommen unsere Podiumsdiskutanten, die, ich habe es eben kennengelernt, mehr Leidenschaft als Lebensjahre in sich vereinigen. Also es ist wirklich toll, mit Ihnen zu diskutieren. Wir hatten eben gerade draußen, hatten wir es von Donald Trump und Hillary Clinton und aktuellen Entwicklungen, haben wir über die Flüchtlingskrise diskutiert. Also Sie dürfen sich freuen auf ganz, ganz wache Zeitgenossen und wir freuen uns natürlich auf das, was Sie uns berichten werden. Es ist Dr. Yves Begbeder, ehemaliger Assistent des französischen Richters Henri Donnieu de Vabre. Es ist Moritz Fuchs, ehemaliger Leibwächter von Robert H. Jackson. Und es ist Dr. George Sackheim, ehemaliger Dolmetscher bei den Nürnberger Prozessen. Ich begrüße weiter Herrn Thomas Händel, Mitglied des Europaparlaments, sowie weitere Vertreterinnen und Vertreter der Parlamente des Bezirkstags des Nürnberger Stadtrats. Herr Professor Safferling, Mitglied des Kuratoriums und Autor auch unserer Konzeption für die Internationale Agentur Akademie Nürnberger Prinzipien. Ich begrüße ganz herzlich unsere Gäste aus Frankreich, die uns Fritz Körber, der Unermüdliche, mitgebracht hat, Robert Ebras, Überlebender des Massakers von Oradour-sur-Glan und den Bürgermeister der Gemeinde Oradour-sur-Glan, Philippe Lacroix. Ich freue mich, lieber Herr Dr. Dickert, dass Sie bei uns sind, ähm, auch wenn er nicht beim Heimatministerium, sondern beim Justizministerium ist, hat er bald einen zweiten Dienstsitz in Nürnberg und wir wissen ihn an unserer Seite, wenn es um die Akademie geht. Ich freue mich, dass der Gastgeber, der Vizepräsident des Oberlandesgerichts, Manfred Schwertner, bei uns, der im Anschluss, bei uns ist, der im Anschluss ein Grußwort an Sie richten wird. Ich begrüße herzlich Herrn Stadtdekan Hubertus Förster, Herrn Dekan Dirk Wessel, Herrn Rudi Zeslanski, den Vorstand der israelitischen Kultusgemeinde in Nürnberg, Herrn Günter Kloser, Staatsminister im Auswärtigen Amt außer Dienst. Wir werden per Livestream in alle Welt gestreamt, äh, finanziert und gesponsert wird dieser Livestream vom Deutschen Konsulat in Los Angeles und von der Loyola Law School in Los Angeles. Dafür unser Dank, denn das ist wichtig, hier hätten wir viel mehr Menschen reinbringen können. Es war aber notwendig und richtig, dieses Zeitzeugengespräch auch am originalen Ort zu machen. Am 1. Oktober 1946 wurden die Urteile gesprochen. Sie alle wissen es, zwölf Verurteilungen zum Tod, siebenmal Haft und drei Freisprüche. Wir wollen aber nicht auf die juristischen Feinheiten des Prozesses eingehen, sondern die Zeitzeugen fragen, wie sie sich damals gefühlt haben, wie sie Nürnberg wahrgenommen haben, wie sie die Deutschen wahrgenommen haben, wie sie die Prozesse aus ihrer Sicht so viele Jahre später aus ihrem eigenen Erleben uns schildern können. Solche Zeitzeugengespräche in dieser Zeit nach 70 Jahren werfen zwei Grundsatzfragen auf. Die erste, der wir uns alle auseinandersetzen müssen, ist, dass wir an der Schwelle von Zeitgeschichte zur Geschichte stehen, dass uns die Zeitzeugen ausgehen werden irgendwann und dass wir natürlich die Gelegenheiten, die wir finden, mit Zeitzeugen zu sprechen, so intensiv, wie es irgendwie möglich ist, zu nutzen. Die Frage, ob ein neuer, ein anderer Blick auf die Verbrechen des Nationalsozialismus in der Geschichtsforschung und in der Geschichtswissenschaft Einzug halten wird, wenn Zeitgeschichte zur Geschichte wird, werden wir beobachten müssen und sie wird uns bewegen. 
Und das Zweite, was immer eine Rolle spielt, ist dann natürlich der Blick zurück. Helfen uns die Zeitzeugen, aus der Geschichte zu lernen? Helfen sie uns, Vergangenheit zu bewältigen, wie das im Deutschland der 60er Jahre geheißen hat? Oder stimmt, was Hannah Arendt gesagt hat, dass Vergangenheit nie bewältigt werden kann, sondern dass man allenfalls feststellen könne, dass es so und nicht anders gewesen ist? Aber auch das kann ja einen Lernprozess auslösen. Als Deutsche des Jahrgangs 1960 und viele hier sind hier aufgewachsen, haben wir natürlich mit Zeitzeugen noch ein ganz besonderes Gefühl, denn wir hatten sie zu Hause. Die Väter, die Großväter, die Onkel und jeder von uns kennt die Frage, die gestellt werden musste, nämlich was hast du gemacht, warst du dabei, warum hast du nichts dagegen gemacht, auf welcher Seite bist du gestanden und wir alle wissen, das gehört zur Geschichte der Nachkriegsdeutschen dazu. Wir alle wissen, dass manche uns leise erzählt haben und wir wissen, dass viele andere ganz laut geschwiegen haben über das, was sie in der Zeit des Nationalsozialismus gemacht haben. Unsere Kinder werden die Frage nach dem Warum nicht mehr an einen lebenden Menschen, an einen Zeitzeugen adressieren können und es ist Teil unserer Nürnberger Verpflichtung aus der Geschichte der Stadt Nürnberg in der Zeit des Nationalsozialismus dass wir sagen, wir müssen diesen jungen Menschen trotzdem den Blick auf den Nationalsozialismus zeigen. Wir sind der Ort der Täter, wir sind der Ort der Masseninszenierung der Reichsparteitage, der Ort, an dem die sogenannten Nürnberger Rassegesetze erlassen worden sind. Und das ist zu vermitteln und es ist die Frage nach dem Warum zu vermitteln. Gerade jetzt, finde ich, wo in Büchern und Filmen in irgendwelchen YouTube-Videos Hitler oft eher als Komikfigur dargestellt wird und das Ausmaß der Tragödie, dass eben nicht die zwei Dutzend Hauptkriegsverbrecher, sondern Millionen begeisterter Deutscher als Grundlage brauchte und auch als Grundlage hatte, das muss immer wieder vermittelt werden. Manchmal sind es nicht die Worte der Zeitzeugen, sondern die Gesten, ihre Autorität dabei gewesen zu sein, die Vorstellung, was Menschen erlebt haben. Ich bin 1982, wird es gewesen sein, mit dem Kreis Jugendring in der Gedenkstätte in Auschwitz gewesen. Wir haben damals eine Ausstellung in Nürnberg vorbereitet. Und ich bin als junger Kerl, ich war Anfang 20, zum Direktor der damaligen Gedenkstätte Auschwitz hineingelassen worden. Wir haben uns dann unterhalten über die Frage, ob Exponate aus der Gedenkstätte nach Nürnberg exportiert werden dürfen. Und nach langen Diskussionen hat er zugestimmt und wir haben dann bei uns in der israelitischen Kultusgemeinde diese Ausstellung gezeigt. Auschwitz warnt, hieß die damals in den 80er Jahren. Und es war der Versuch deutlich zu machen, mit diesen Haufen von Brillen, mit diesen Koffern, die dort in der Gedenkstätte stehen, um die schiere Zahl der Menschen deutlich zu machen, es war der Versuch, jungen Deutschen diese Geschichte zu erzählen. Das ist heute genauso wichtig wie damals. Und während des Gesprächs fragte ich Herrn Smolen, das war damals der Direktor, er hat noch lang, viele Jahre später, meine Tochter hat ihn noch als Führer dann in der Gedenkstätte sogar erlebt, hat er noch Führungen gemacht, fragte ich ihn, vielleicht naiv, wie lange er denn schon hier sei, also wie lange er Direktor des, der Gedenkstätte ist. Und der Herr Smolen hat dann diese Geste gemacht, hat sein Hemd hochgezogen und man sieht dann die tätowierte Häftlingsnummer und hat geantwortet, hier bin ich schon sehr lang. Das ist Gesten, das ist eine Geste, die nur ein Zeitzeuge machen konnte und eine Geste, die ich vermutlich in meinem ganzen Leben nicht mehr vergessen werde. Wir sollten also zuhören und zuschauen, was die Zeitzeugen uns erzählen. Wir sollten auf ihre Gesten achten und auch auf die Gefühle die sie uns vermitteln, wenn sie von dem damals Erlebten berichten. Und natürlich lebt dieser Prozess heute noch. Er ist Geburtsstunde des Völkerstrafrechts. Fünf Jahre gibt es das Memorium, ein kleiner Geburtstag für uns. Wir arbeiten eng zusammen mit der Justiz, mit dem Freistaat Bayern. Wir hatten 370.000 Besucher, Tendenz steigend. Und wir haben die Internationale Akademie Nürnberger Prinzipien mit der wir versuchen wollen, der universalen Gültigkeit dieser Prinzipien der Menschenrechte und der Menschenwürde 
in aller Welt ein wenig mehr Geltung zu verleihen. Dazu gehört, gehört auch und immer auch natürlich die Diskussion um den ICC, um den Internationalen Strafgerichtshof und um die Frage, wie viele Staaten ihn für sich akzeptieren und für sich nicht akzeptieren. Das alles sind die Geschichten, die Nürnberg erzählt, die diese Stadt erzählt, als Stadt der Täter, die sich ihrer Vergangenheit stellt, die sie nicht bewältigt. Das ist nie unser Ziel gewesen. So und nicht anders ist es gewesen. Das ist die Aufgabe für uns, es den jungen Leuten, die eben dann den Papa, den Großvater und den Onkel nicht mehr fragen können, es ihnen genauso zu erzählen. Dazu dient unter anderem auch der heutige Abend, zu dem ich Sie ganz, ganz herzlich begrüße. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, wir gedenken heute der 70. Wiederkehr des Beginns des Hauptkriegsverbrecherprozesses hier im Sitzungssaal 600 des Nürnberger Justizpalastes. Hier in diesem Saal wurde ab 20. November 1945 die Hauptverhandlung gegen 22 Angeklagte, die im NS-Staat führende Funktionen hatten, durchgeführt. Wollte man es oder will man es juristisch korrekt betrachten, begann der Prozess allerdings bereits einen Monat früher, nämlich am 18. Oktober 1945 durch die Übergabe der Anklageschrift, die im Gebäude des Alliierten Kontrollrats in Berlin stattfand. Die Stadt Nürnberg, die Internationale Akademie Nürnberger Prinzipien und der Freistaat Bayern, genauer die Justiz, nehmen den heutigen Jahrestag zum Anlass, mit jeweils eigenen Veranstaltungen an die Öffentlichkeit heranzutreten. Um etwaigen Missverständnissen vorzubeugen, dies geschieht nicht deshalb, weil wir uns gegenseitig Konkurrenz machen wollen. Ganz im Gegenteil, der Herr Oberbürgermeister hat es gesagt, wir kooperieren äh, hier bei der Nutzung der Räume in diesem Gebäude, insbesondere dieses Sitzungssaals, aber auch bei der Aufarbeitung der NS-Vergangenheit. Dementsprechend sind auch die Themen der stattfindenden Veranstaltungen nicht überschneidend, sondern sich gegenseitig ergänzend. Die Internationale Akademie Nürnberger Prinzipien hält heute und morgen ihr Annual Forum zum Thema The Nuremberg Principles 70 Years Later ab. Und bereits gestern fand in diesem Saal die Eröffnung einer Ausstellung der Justiz über den Frankfurter Auschwitzprozess statt. Diese Ausstellung kann bis zum 29. Januar nächsten Jahres im zweiten Stock des Hauptgebäudes des Justizpalastes äh, angeschaut und betrachtet werden. Diese Ausstellung ist Teil einer größeren Gesamtausstellung, die vom Hessischen Studienzentrum für Finanzverwaltung und Justiz unter dem Motto Verstrickung der Justiz in das NS-System 1933 bis 1945 erstellt wurde. Ich glaube, dann ist an dieser Stelle eine kurze selbstkritische Anmerkung aus Sicht der Justiz notwendig. Die deutsche Nachkriegsjustiz war äußerst zögerlich bei der Aufarbeitung des Nazi-Unrechts. Der Frankfurter Auschwitz-Prozess von 1963 bis 1965 hatte stattgefunden, war einer der wenigen spektakulären Prozesse, in denen die unfassbaren Verbrechen der nationalsozialistischen Unrechtsherrschaft ans Licht der Öffentlichkeit gebracht wurden. Zurück zur heutigen Veranstaltung des Memoriums. Thema Zeitzeugen erinnern sich. Die Erinnerung befasst sich mit Vorgängen aus der Vergangenheit. Damit die Frage zu verbinden, was seitdem geschehen ist, ist naheliegend. Tut man dies, so stellt man fest, dass die vom amerikanischen Chefankläger Jackson formulierten Nürnberger Prinzipien bereits wenige Wochen nach Verkündung des Urteils im Nürnberger Hauptkriegsverbrecherprozess von der UNO zu allgemeinen Prinzipien des Völkerrechts erklärt wurden. Anschließend ist allerdings recht wenig passiert. Erst in den 90er Jahren des vergangenen Jahrhunderts wurden mit dem Jugoslawien- und dem Ruanda-Tribunal zwei Ad-Hoc-Strafgerichtshöfe geschaffen, die die Nürnberger Prinzipien als Grundlage für ihre Verhandlungen nutzten. Es folgte 1998 das römische Statut für, der, für einen internationalen Strafgerichtshof, 
das im Jahr 2002 durch die Schaffung des ICC umgesetzt worden ist. Leider, muss man sagen, fehlt es diesem Gerichtshof bisher an hinreichender internationaler Akzeptanz. Dem römischen Statut sind bisher nur ca. zwei Drittel der UN-Mitgliedstaaten beigetreten. Mit den USA und Russland fehlen sogar zwei der vier Mächte, die am Nürnberger Prozess mitgewirkt haben. Wir sollten uns aber, meine ich, dadurch nicht entmutigen lassen. Denn die vor dem ICC bereits durchgeführten und die noch laufenden Verhandlungen und Verfahren zeigen, dass die Nürnberger Prinzipien an Brauchbarkeit und Aktualität für ein modernes Völkerstrafrecht nicht verloren haben. Umso spannender finde ich es heute, Menschen zuhören zu können, die die erstmalige Anwendung dieser Prinzipien in einem Prozess miterlebt haben. Dabei ist für mich besonders interessant, dass die heute hier anwesenden Zeugen sehr unterschiedliche Funktionen hatten und die Ereignisse damit aus unterschiedlichen Blickwinkeln schildern können. Möge uns das, was wir jetzt im Podiumsgespräch erfahren, gut im Gedächtnis bleiben, damit wir später zwar nicht als Zeitzeugen, aber als Zeugen vom Hören sagen, von den Geschehnissen, die Gegenstand des Nürnberger Prozesses waren, berichten und diese Dinge weitergeben können. Vielen Dank. Good evening. As we think about 70 years and some dimensions of humanity's great progress, I begin by congratulating the city of Nuremberg. It has become, for the world, for historical study and for contemporary pursuits of human rights, justice, and law, truly a beacon and a guiding light. This development was unfathomable, I suspect, to everyone who lived and worked in Nuremberg in the Palace of Justice in courtroom 600 in 1945. Yet here we are. And what happened here 70 years ago, and then how individuals later picked up and advanced that legacy in Nuremberg, in Germany, in other nations, and in the international community, was and is the light that guides us in dark times and forward. So thank you deeply, Mr. Lord Mayor, Mr. Justice, the city officials, all named earlier the memoriam, and all who have played a role with dedication, talent, and leadership, and for generously inviting me to speak this evening and to moderate a conversation that I know will be very special. The conversation, which we will get to promptly, will feature three special men who did work here in 1945 and 1946. Dr. Yves Begbader, Father Moritz Fuchs, and Dr. George Sockheim. They were young men then, and it is our great fortune now that they have not succumbed much, even to middle age. I will introduce them more when our group conversation begins, and you have biographical information on them in your program. For now, I will note that like all of their Nuremberg trial colleagues, they did not fathom then what Nuremberg, the city, the historical legacy, and the contemporary beacon of law and human rights has become. As one of them said to me with a smile last evening, as he stood in Nuremberg for the first time since 1946, where is the rubble? And that is my topic for this evening, a date, November 20, 1945, which marked in this land and in this room a milestone in humanities, in civilizations climb from rubble and wreckage toward light and law, toward reason and hope. How did they get here? The Allied powers who conducted the Nuremberg trial won first a world war. They defeated militarily at great cost the Nazi aggression that destroyed this land and the European continent. I begin with war and power because too many overlook those necessary predicates. In his opening statement at Nuremberg 70 years ago tomorrow, Justice Robert H. Jackson, the chief US prosecutor and the principal architect of the Nuremberg trial called it one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. The reason, the thinking, the justice, and the morality of the Nuremberg trial deserve our attention and admiration. But do not overlook the predicate, the hard-won assets that those allied payors, 
acquired, and then chose, with reason, to spend here at Nuremberg. It was their power that paid for their reason. It was their power, first in waging and winning a defensive war against aggressors, and then in militarily occupying this surrendered land that permitted them to hold individuals legally accountable for the crimes of war. The path to November 20, 1945 had many other origins. A second was the experience of the Great War, World War I and its aftermath. 30 years before 1945, many had, as young men, seen and fought what they regarded as German military aggression, and then seen peace and negotiation that failed to produce legal accountability or deterrence. A third beginning was in the landscape of laws, norms, and morals that long preceded Nazi power and war making. The Hague Convention, co Conventions committed nations to laws in war. Treaties between nations and among many nations, including the kellogg briand Pact, committed nations and their leaders to give up war making as a national policy instrument. A fourth beginning was a consistent developing legal view in the United States and elsewhere that saw Nazi military aggression as individual and group criminality. This was the heart of then United States Attorney General Robert Jackson's August 1940 legal opinion to President Roosevelt, explaining why US neutrality laws permitted assistance to Great Britain, the victim of Nazi aggression. It grew into the legal basis for expanded US lend-lease arrangements with Britain and the Soviet Union. It undergirded the November 1943 Moscow Declaration, in which their foreign ministers committed, on behalf of President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Stalin, that the major Nazi war criminals, those whose crimes transcended any particular geographic location, would be, after their military defeat and capture, held accountable by the Allies jointly. It was reiterated at Yalta in February 1945, and then at Potsdam that summer. The path to this room on November 20, 1945, had those military, as in capacity, political, as in decision-making, and conceptual, as in legal thinking, dimensions. It also came about through personality. In addition to Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, and their generals and other key advisors, US President Harry Truman played a decisive role. In April 1945, just weeks after inheriting the presidency, he embraced and demonstrated his great seriousness about the Allied commitments to prosecute captured Nazis, which Truman then believed could include Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, and others who never reached this courtroom. By appointing a leading national figure and legal star, Justice Jackson, to serve as US Chief of Counsel. In time, that Truman seriousness, that choice of Jackson, led Great Britain, the USSR, and France to commit seriously to a rule of law endeavor. In London, during the summer of 1945, the Allies negotiated at length across differing legal systems and concepts of how the Nazi prisoners should be treated. Jackson, with British support, insisted on the substance of American due process. And in time, the Soviets, the principal advocates of summary proceedings and foreordained punishment, agreed. The August 8, 1945 London Agreement created the Four Nation International Military Tribunal. The IMT was given jurisdiction to try and punish European Axis actors who had committed crimes against peace, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or conspiracy to commit any of those other crimes. The agreement provided that every person, even a head of state, was liable, and that no underling could defend by pointing to a superior's orders. And the agreement provided for defendants' rights, the independence of the tribunal, the prosecutor's burden of proof, the defendant's right to counsel, compulsory process, discovery, and resources. The path to this room on November 20, 1945, also came about through logistics. It was the US Army, including Generals Eisenhower, Lucius Clay, Edward Betts, and Walter Beadle Smith, who recommended Nuremberg. This city was in the US occupation zone, so the US Army could secure and supply a trial here. Nuremberg also had this mostly intact large courthouse, with this room 
that could be reconstructed for the trial and the adjoining large prison for defendants and other arrestees. The Army brought Justice Jackson to inspect Nuremberg and this room on July 8, 1945. Impressed, he on July 21st brought British and French colleagues from London to see Nuremberg. They agreed that this should be the trial site, and in time, the Russians made that decision unanimous. Much work remained to be done, of course. In London, Paris, Berlin, and elsewhere, Allied personnel captured and reviewed documents and interrogated prisoners. In Nuremberg, the Palace of Justice was repaired and courtroom 600 was fitted for the trial. Allied lawyers drafted and redrafted charges. Ultimately, they produced an indictment charging 24 individuals and six Nazi organizations. The chief prosecutors agreed upon the indictment and presented it to the IMT in Berlin on October 18, 1945. Ironically, in the Kammergericht courtroom where Judge Roland Freisler had presided in the Nazi's People's Court proceedings just months earlier. And of course, this room too, in the Nazi period, saw horrors perpetrated in the guise of law. Personnel relocated to Nuremberg, staying in the Grand Hotel and in requisitioned houses all around Nuremberg. Staffs grew. The US staff became large and then very large. The indictment was served on each defendant, and each was assisted in obtaining counsel of choice. The tribunal tried out this courtroom, and then in mid-November, proceedings began on pretrial motions. Lawyers worked furiously around the clock, and many, but not all, worked superbly to assemble evidentiary cases against each defendant. Justice Jackson worked to write an opening statement that would explain the enormity and detail of the prosecutions. It was not clear until the very last minute that the trial would start on November 20th. The Palace of Justice hallways and cafeteria, which was then serving daily lunch to 800 people, were filled with rumors of delay. On Monday, November 19th, however, the tribunal handled final issues and logistics. The word was go. The Nuremberg trial began the next morning. Major Joseph Dano, a law professor soldier who brought international law expertise and particular writing skill to Jackson's US prosecution staff, attended the opening session. That evening, at his billet on Lindenstrasse in Dombach, down the block from Jackson's and Father Fuchs' own billet, Dano penned this description to his wife in Fairfax, Virginia. Court opened right on time. The place was full of people and orderliness and awe. The 20 defendants sat obediently in their box. The judges wore robes except the Russians in military uniform. The German Defense Council wore robes and flimsy beret sort of black cap, which resembled a Jewish skull cap, a yarmulke, more than anything else. One old timer wore a long mauve, mauve robe with purple velvet trimming. The council tables were filled with polished looking prosecutors. The press section downstairs was full of newsmen who had been writing stories for several days. The big floodlights were on and the cameras were clicking and grinding from all directions in unseen and unobtrusive spots. The balcony started off with VIPs ranging from lieutenant generals and major generals through interminable ranks of military and civilian down to the private who was the guard at the door. Everybody had a set of earphones and a dial control. Joe Dano in that letter also noted some of the striking features of this room and I encourage you to turn your head with me as I read this paragraph. The main part of the courtroom has three big doors. Over each there is a carving depicting a symbolic picture. Over the main door is a tree and Adam and Eve. Over a side door, a sand glass. Over the door to the left of the defendants is the scale of justice surmounting the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. That there was a Nuremberg trial, that individuals with enormous power decided to pay tribute to reason by, in Jackson's opening words, submitting their captive enemies to the judgment of the law was and is a shining, leading light. That this room, with its striking features and ghosts, its echoing voices, its absent friends deeply missed, stands 
and welcomes and teaches is an enduring asset for the world. That we are here tonight with three men who worked here 70 years ago is great luck and a privilege. And the conversation ahead is sure to be an inspiration. Thank you again, and I now invite my friend George, friends George Sockheim, Moritz Fuchs, and Eve Begbader to join me for a conversation. Gentlemen, speaking on behalf of the room, long time no see. I'd like to begin with your individual background, the life story in a small capsule that uh, brought you to this land and the work you did in this room. Um, Father Fuchs, let me begin with you. Well, I was a plain soldier when the war ended. I was the first infantry division, a replacement in October of 1944, came over on a troop ship, 15,000 aboard, Scotland and Cherbourg. We landed, uh, went across the channel, we had to go into uh, landing craft by rope nets, climbing down the one, splashing into the water. They got us on trucks, and we went uh, all the way up to Verviers, near west of Aachen, where I had one overnight before I went into battle. Uh, the Hurtgen Forest is an area just east of around Aachen, and uh, I found it only about four years ago that in that battle campaign, which lasted about a month, we had 30,000 battle casualties, of which I was one. Yesterday was my 71st anniversary of that event, which kept me three months in the hospital at Blandford, England. And when I got back three months later, I missed the Battle of the Bulge. I spent that time in the hospital. And I came back to exactly the same area that had left before. Uh, after that battle, we can, Roosevelt died. That was in April uh, when we were in the Hearts Mountains. And then from then on, we went to the 3rd Division under General Patton. And we ended up in Czechoslovakia. And I came here by way of a... Great, turned out to be a great friend, John T. Corley, a lieutenant colonel. He was our battalion commander. And when we moved back from Czechoslovakia and give Russians over the, up to the border, uh, we came back to uh, Ansbach, southwest of Nuremberg here. And uh, he, he told me, he said, we've got responsibility for policing the SS prisoners we've got up there around Nuremberg. A lot of rubble in the streets, and you got to get them working to clean it up so cars can get through. But we've got some very important persons coming. One of them we've got to get special care of. I'm responsible that nothing cares, hurts him. You've got the job. So he gave me a 45 pistol and a blackjack in my back pocket. One of those extendable kind of things where if you hit somebody, you hit them not on the front, you hit them on the back of the head. And uh, that's how I got here. George Sockheim, uh, you actually came uh, a little bit earlier, uh, as in originally, and then back. Uh, tell us briefly your path to the Nuremberg trial. Okay. Well, I was a, a member of military intelligence service. No, 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 no. Where were you born? Oh, <laughs> okay. I was, Give me a sentence or two on that. I was born in Hamburg, Germany in 1923. My father was the director of the municipal theater. And three years later, he was promoted to Erste Dramaturg at the Frankfurter Schauspielhaus. And we moved to, to Frankfurt, and I went to school there. And we lived there until 1931, 
when we went on a summer vacation to the island of Hiddensee, and unfortunately, my father developed a ruptured appendix, and nothing could be done for him. He was operated on in Berlin by Professor Sauerbruch, who was then the most famous surgeon in Germany, but my father died from the ruptured appendix, and... Uh, and then you and your mother soon... We moved to Palestine in, in early 33. My parents were social democrats and Zionists, and after Hitler came to power, my mother was promptly fired from the, uh, from the newspaper that she worked for, and uh, she, she lost her job, and she said, uh, that man means business. He is not going to rest. This is now April 33. He means business. He's not going to rest until Deutschland wieder Judenfrei ist. And we're not staying here. We're going to Palestine. My parents were Zionists. So we moved to mm -hmm. Palestine. And I went to school there, and my mother started driving a taxi and was a chauffeur and took people to see all the he heights of the Holy Land. And then you leave Palestine and yeah, when become I was, an American. My mother developed cancer and got very ill, and uh, she made arrangements with my aunt, my father's sister, who had been a doctor in Berlin, but moved to New York, and my aunt agreed to bring me up. And so in, 19, in the spring of 38, I moved from Palestine to New York and went to high school there and then to Columbia University for my bachelor's and my master's. And then after the war, you know, I went to New York University. Okay. And military service brought you to France initially, and then uh, the path to Nuremberg. Well, military service brought me to France. I went to Camp Ritchie, Maryland, which was the military intelligence training center. And I got to France on D plus seven when the Germans were defeating, were defending the Nuremberg beaches, but the Americans and the British were stronger, pushed them back, and uh, I joined them when they were in front of a place called St. Mary Eglise. And uh, my job, uh, I had gone to Camp Ritchie, Maryland, which was the military intelligence training center for the United States, and learned how to interrogate prisoners of war for military information. And what we wanted to know then was where are the tanks where is the artillery? Uh, where are the mine minefields? You know, anything that would help our troops advance into France and Belgium. And that was, that's what I was trained at during the war, and what, that's what I became. So fighting, and then occupation, and then you're about to go home when you see a poster. Right. I, was, uh, I had 70 credits, which is what you needed to be allowed to go home. And I was in a little town called Etampes near Paris. And on a uh, soil, I know. bulletin <laughs> well, board. A what? Bulletin board? Bulletin board. I saw a sign that they were looking for German speaking interpreters. So uh, I thought very quickly, you know, I can go back to the university anytime and continue in my second year, but I could not uh, ever be present at such an international famous trial. And so I competed as an interpreter for the Nuremberg trials, and I passed, and together with several others, they flew me to Nuremberg, and I started working there, I think it was, uh, oh, maybe October 10th or something like that, 1945, and I stayed for six months until the 1st of May and worked as an interpreter. Hauptsächlich, and I'll have some stories to right. tell we'll you about We'll, of course, that. come yep. back to that. Yep. Uh, Eve, uh, you were the uh, closest, perhaps, uh, and you came the latest. Tell us a little bit about your story that brought you through life to Nuremberg. I start with my birth or not? Yes? Yes, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, 16 July 1924. But my, my story By the is way, we're not doing an age competition here, but they immediately asked each other <laughs> upon meeting, how old are you, how old are you? <laughs> and I'm not sure if the goal was to be the youngest or the oldest, but they're each one year off from the next. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I did uh, law studies because I didn't know what to do, and I thought law is all right because then I can diversify. Uh, then uh, as soon as I had finished my law degree, I got a phone call from my aunt, I said, your uncle wants you in Nuremberg. And your uncle? 
he done Dieu de Vab, who was the French judge. So I said, no, I cannot come because I've got a Boy Scout camp. <laughs> and then eventually it was negotiated and, uh, right. and I did go. Right. You, you skipped over uh, the war years and, and uh, some of your experience in a, a country that was occupied. Sure. <clears throat> yes, well, it, it, it was not a sort of a saga. It was a, I, I spent a few months in a maquis in uh, Auvergne, in the, in the mountains there. And uh, thanks God we never met any, any, any Germans. We had, uh, had a few uh, Stukas who came to bomb us, but uh, I was always a volunteer. Uh, and thanks God there was nobody in front, so uh, I was safe and I remained alive. Right. But that, that was short, a few months, and then uh, went back to finish by low degree. Right, so your actual arrival here in Nuremberg to work for your uncle was when? Um, March 1946. March of 1946. So in the sequence of the trial uh, that brings Father Fuchs here as a bodyguard at the beginning, uh, September or thereabouts, and October for George Sockheim, and in the trial well underway for Dr. Begbader. Uh, tell us about the respective jobs. Uh, to work as an assistant to a judge on the tribunal, and I'm going to gesture at that part of the room because the bench was there. What, what did that entail? <coughs> I said, uh, my uncle told me to get, every day we got the verbatim records on, on all the 22 uh, defendants. He gave me seven, and he said, you pick up from the daily output in French uh, over those seven defendants, and then you uh, simplify, you summarize them and then you dictate to French secretaries and give it to the two judges, to Donadieu and to Falco. So that was a new job for me, but I never had any job before, so I couldn't compare. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no, no legal qualification. So I was eminently qualified for the job. <laughs> and uh, there it went, and uh, it was okay, because at the end of my stay, they said, uh, they gave me a certificate of a satisfactory uh, performance. So was he, <laughs> was he using your digests for study in the evening? Was that the, the so use? I, you were preparing these summaries of the yes. testimony pertaining to different defendants. Yeah. Uh, how did he use that material? Do you know? How did, no, no, that I don't know. Okay. Maybe this way it throws them away. Uh, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I hope I was of some help to, Doubt, to Doubtful. Um, let me jump to the... Uh, essential practicality of work, which is keeping the boss alive. Uh, what was a bodyguard's job? Well, I graduated to a snub nose, pistol under arm, after about two weeks, when they decided I should be inconspicuous, just anonymous in the crowd. So instead, of, I had a plain uniform. <laughs> and uh, whenever Jackson was in the courtroom, I was there. Whenever he was in his office, I was there. Whenever we went home, which was quite regular. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the, the job itself was not strenuous, it was a great relief. Uh, we drove from first Dombach daily, usually by a different route. Right. You should uh, say where you actually bunked in oh yeah. that house, Lindenstrasse 33. Yeah. It was a house that the roof had been blown off but, uh, for a third floor, but the second and first floor were still in pretty good shape. And uh, there was uh, uh, an entryway glassed in, uh, stairs going up into it, uh, the only entrance to the house on the front side. And I was there, and that was my lodging. My bed was there, and uh, a little telephone system they arranged to contact the folks upstairs. And uh, there was a, a guard post on the road. That was the first check they had. Then they had to check by me before they go in, and then I would announce their arrival if they were there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the drives from Dombach to the courthouse? We, we drove uh, regularly, and you, usually by an unpredicted route. Uh, Jackson made the choice, I'm not sure, but more often than not, he did not know. They just went different ways. Uh, he was persuaded that if anybody was going to get you, they'd get you, no matter what you can do. You can't protect against that much evil. But uh, happily, we're safe. Uh, the car itself was rather interesting. It, the army had taken it over from von Ribbentrop, who wasn't going to use it anymore. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a Mercedes, 16-cylinder. The front was kind of like a Packard car at those days. 
two rows of eight cylinders, 75 gallon tank capacity. Uh, I got three miles to a gallon. <laughs> it's about as long as the bench behind us, right? Yeah. <laughs> One time when Jackson wasn't with us, we had it out on the highway, 120 kilometers. That's, we got up there, right up there. And then we blew a tire on the right rear. And there was not a fragment of the tube. At that time, they had tube tires. There was not a tube left, tube larger than your thumbnail. But uh, we had no incidents, no attacks. At one time during the trial, there was some kind of alarm given, and the Army sent small light tanks to each, at least each corner of the courtyard. And uh, they were, it passed over. Mm -hmm. George, let me ask you about interpreting. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, which our colleagues are doing masterfully, obviously, in the back yeah. of the room. Uh, it's a, a great talent to hear and think in two languages simultaneously. Uh, was it hard? Sometimes it was hard, but, you know, I was young and flexible, and I was fluent in both languages. Okay. So and what I, kinds of work, before the trial starts, let's talk about that phase, uh, what kind of interpreting were you doing? Well, when we first came, they gave us tons of documents that we had to translate that were going to be used in evidence at the trial. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, orders that uh, from Admiral Dernitz, he ordered that any ship that was sank, if there were any sailors in a rowboat, they were not to be saved, they were not to be helped, that they could just put up a machine gun and mow down these sailors. That was totally against the Geneva Convention. But we had to have all kinds of documents mm -hmm. uh, about these leaders and what they ordered. Right. But you weren't really there to be a document translator. Well, we did both, really. Okay. Uh, the, the most prestigious group, I found out later, were the people who worked only in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. They sat there and they listened to the testimony in German and translated it into English or into Russian mm -hmm. or into French. And uh, they sat right there, right? Right there, the, yes. And corner. they made sure that everybody understood the proceedings. Now, you didn't work as one of those interpreters. No, I didn't. I okay. worked uh, as an interrogation interpreter. So tell us about the interrogation process. OK, well, can I give you some examples? Sure. Uh, well, well, we'll come back to a particular example. I want to understand the, the basic mechanics. You're in, you're in the bullpen, as I imagine it. You're yes. translating documents. Yeah. Then what happens? All right, we would get a, a buzz or a call that you needed a room such and such for an interpretation. And when you came in there, there would be some uh, well-known distinguished defendant or a witness against them. And the, uh, the attorneys were a high-ranking American, usually lieutenant colonels or colonels or majors who had been really distinguished attorneys in their hometowns, respected people, but they didn't know any English. In, oh, they didn't know any German, mm -hmm. excuse me. So they needed the interpreter to translate their questions into German and then the defendant's answer in, into English. And that's mm -hmm. what my job was. Okay. For example, who were some of the people who you interpreted interrogations of during that pretrial phase? Well, one of them was Goering. We've I heard of him. Tell us yeah. more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Um, let me just find that page because it's, it's really an, an interesting bit of information. Take me a moment. He was, Sorry. He was a glamour boy. Yeah, well, he was uh, a glamour boy. That's... Okay, this is what I was looking okay. for. Uh, Goering, of course, was uh, rather grandiose, and he thought that he would deserve special treatment, which he did not get. He had to surrender all his insignia and everything. But uh, his, here's my translation of, uh, he was asked by my interrogator uh, why they spent so much time bombing London. And this was his answer. I, he, this is Goering. I told him, Hitler, time and time again that we must destroy the English war industry instead of wasting our bombs, dropping them on that stupid London. What good would it do us if a few hundred more houses would go up in flames? And Hitler just wouldn't listen to him. Even though de Goering was a general and he was a second in command, he just ignored him. And then the same with Bath. Bath was a resort, as you know if anybody's ever visited England. 
beautiful resort, so, sort of like Wiesbaden. And uh, he was ordered to attack Bath by, by the Fuhrer and on Hitler's orders to harass the British. And he disputed that. He said, what's the point? It's a resort. And Hitler said, I want you to attack Bath immediately. So uh, Hitler didn't, I mean, he listened to an argument, but he had the last word. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was quite unreasonable. In the interpretation, you're really the person conversing with a Goering. Yes, that's right. Would you have informal or side exchanges or byplay, or was it just the interrogator's question and then uh, the uh, answer coming back? I think it was mostly that. We were not supposed to extemporize. You okay. know, we were young. Okay. Were you ever tempted? <laughs> yes, but perhaps I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, uh, Father, you mentioned uh, Goering as a glamour boy. Eve, you sat right in front of the judges when you were in the courtroom directly across from the defendants. Um, what's your recollection of how you perceived them then? What was it like to sit here and to be uh, a spectator? Uh, was it judges? No, the defendants. Oh, the defendants. <coughs> well, the defendants. It was, yeah, it was very, <coughs> very impressive, especially the uh, Goering has uh, next door and admirals and generals. Uh, but there was not too much to, to report there, except uh, I, I knew later on, of course, that Goering sort of uh, manipulated uh, most of the defendants. Some resisted, uh, like Speer, mm -hmm. but uh, s some of them were quite interesting in their testimonies mm -hmm. so, or in their defense. Right. I mean, you're, you're studying the seven of them in detail. Uh, uh, yes, uh, but uh, on paper. On paper. Because I was not supposed... I was I was to be in the kitchen, not in the main room. Okay. So sometimes I came there, and sometimes it was interesting to listen to some of the... Right. the Let me the ask debates. about a particular defendant, Hans Frank. Yeah. Um, you were in the courtroom during some of his testimony. Uh, yes, I, I must have been, because I wrote a little article there at that time, because he was the first one... I mean, they all pleaded not guilty, all, all of them, uh, against all possible evidence, of course. But uh, Hans then, after some debates, said that he, he felt a terrible, terrible guilt. Uh, so that, that was something new, sort of recognition that the whole trial was about what was useful. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he said something like, a deep feeling of guilt. The, a thousand years will pass before Germany will be exonerated of this burden. Okay, I, I thought it was really, and he said he was converted to, to the Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic uh, religion, so okay. Th then you can go because you are you're converted, so no, nothing. No, but anyway, I felt that this was something significant mm -hmm. among all the, the debates. In the, in the moment, you I, thought it was authentic and uh, powerful? Yes, uh, yes and no, I was not quite sure, but later mm -hmm. on, I was, it was disproved because in his final statement before uh, before the, the judgments, mm -hmm. he sort of went back. And, and there was no guilt on his part. It was guilt in general, but not on his part. So he said, I've done my duty, etc. What the, the others said, I, I obeyed uh, Hitler, it's not me. Et mm -hmm. So it's, it was a bit of a fake. Right. Uh, you mentioned your interest, your background in scouting, and that led your uncle to... Uh, assign or call your attention to von Schirach. Yeah, von, von Schirach, I thought it was a bit of, of a joke on the part of my uncle, but I said, why not? Uh, <laughs> Hitler Jungen, the, the chief, of course, and uh, accused of so many things, mm -hmm. of training the young boys for the army, for the SS, etc. Uh, I looked up a bit this, what, what uh, Judge Alternate Falco uh, said about it, that uh, he sort of, uh, he, he was really devoted to, to Hitler, and he, he was anti-Semitic, he recognized that, like some others, they said, okay, I, I'm anti-Semitic, but I don't want those to be burned or something. So that's a sort of subtle difference there. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, I'm not, I don't know, I didn't know about all that until 1944, again, like, uh, like many of the others. But uh, he, he sort of, uh, uh, Baldur von Schirach initially sort of uh, uh, was uh, subdued to Göring as, 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 as a boss, the chief. Uh, and, uh, he, he stressed Hitler's orders as, uh, as an excuse, like all the others. 
<coughs> but he was not only Hitler Jürgen in chief, but he was also a Goliath in Au Austria. So, sort of uh, being, not knowing anything was uh, fell, fell, fell through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Father Fuchs, let me ask you you're in the courtroom, your focus is on Jackson and his safety, but obviously mm -hmm. you're witnessing these proceedings. Uh, the headphones are there for you to listen in, the defendants are there for you to look at. Uh, how did you perceive them? What, what struck you about these men? Well, they evidently uh, were trapped, and they were quite aware of that, because they, had, they dressed in simply, they were allowed to wear some of their own clothes, but very simple, uh, and they, they dressed just for the courtroom. They wore shabby clothes back in the prison. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but their appearance were ones of beaten men. They got caught. Uh, there was some evidence at time that uh, there was some uh, maybe repentance, you might call it. Uh, but for the most part, they were just taken aback by learning an awful lot of what was going on that, that might have happened in someone else's department, but not in mine. Well, I heard about that, but I never heard about this. And uh, so there was, especially when they came on the screen on this wall here, some of the visual evidence mm -hmm. of what was going the film, on. film, right. They had to be, they were really, oh, surprised. The horror of it certainly made an impression on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they got caught. Right. Totally. Now, on, the, on the drives and in the non courtroom hours and other occasions, you're residing with Jackson, you're in the house, Jackson, his secretary, his son, and you, mm -hmm. small family, really. Right. Uh, would he discuss no. this proceeding, what no. he was thinking, Not on, how it was On the way, nor at home, never, no. Okay. Uh, so his, similarly his presentations to, were strictly in the courtroom. Right. Similarly to Judge Donadu Devab. No. Um, okay. But he worked hard, uh, obviously. Uh, and he wrote all of his, I heard that he wrote all of his notes by hand. And uh, the secretary was very good at typing on mm -hmm. pages and pages and pages. Mm -hmm. I was impressed when the trial was over, he gave me a set of the volumes of the whole proceedings from the courtroom. 42 volumes, blue bound. They took up 12 feet of space on a shelf. Uh, it's an amazing all detail. It's an, enorm it's an enormous record. Uh, George, during the course of the trial, um, the fugitive, Rudolf Hurst, yes. was apprehended and brought to Nuremberg right. uh, for interrogation. Uh, and I believe the records are very clear that you're interrogating, you're interpreting the initial interrogations of the Commandant of Auschwitz. Uh, tell us about that. Okay, I spent uh, two two-hour sessions with him as the interrogator, as the interpreter for the interrogator. And uh, we got quite a bit of information. At that time, he was a willing talker. He didn't try to cover up or hide anything. And he admitted to the most horrendous deeds. So I will tell you some things. Uh, I wrote a letter the next day after I, I interpreted for him to my aunt in New York, the lady who had brought me from Palestine. She was a doctor in New York. So I, I will read you a little bit out of that letter and you'll get a feel for this man's attitude. Uh, this is April 2nd, 46, and, and on April 1st I had interpreted for him. And she saved the letter and when she died I found it among her belongings. So I wrote, only yesterday I interpreted at the interrogation of Rudolf Hirsch the former commandant of the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex of concentration camps. He had been at large working on a farm in Schleswig-Holstein until he was picked up by the British Intelligence Service about a month ago. He is one of the most depraved, degenerate types of characters it has ever been my misfortune to meet. Up until yesterday, well, I considered myself hardened by the war, but but the accounts that this beast of a man gave in the most matter-of-fact tone of voice of brutal, sadistic acts committed at Auschwitz and the dispassionate manner in which he related the horrors and the inhuman suffering connected with the extermination of two million Jews during his three years in office made me feel both physically 
ill and mentally very distressed. After an experience such as this, one gets a feeling of extreme futility. What's the use of it all? Nothing we can do here can bring those six million martyred people back to life. And when we pinned him down and asked him why all this, now he gives his rationale, and I think that's not too well known but interesting. Why all this? His reply was, I'll give it to you in German. Der Führer hat im Sommer des Jahres 1944 beschlossen, dass die Judenfrage jetzt endgültig gelöst wird. In other words, in the summer of 1944, the Führer decided that the Jewish question now has to be finally solved. The facts show that Hitler communicated his wishes to his strong arm man, Himmler, who in turn called Hirsch from Auschwitz to Berlin and gave him Hitler's order, adding of his own, wenn wir jetzt nicht die jüdische Rasse vollkommen ausrotten, wird die jüdische Rasse das deutsche Volk vernichten. So that means if we do not exterminate the Jewish race completely now, the Jewish race will annihilate the German people. Now that is something that I learned much later in psychology and psychoanalysis. It's called a projection mechanism, where you really attribute your own unacceptable wishes uh, and ascribe them to somebody else. So uh, he then ordered Hearst to build additional gas chambers and crematoria. People like Hearst, who incidentally was made a brigadier general in the Totenkopfverbände for his outstanding pioneer work in the final solution of the Jewish problem, actually believed Hitler and Himmler's diabolical theses. He believed it. And then he went about to do their dirty work for them. I think the, the colonel, the uh, chief uh, interrogator, asked him whether he believed this. And he said that uh, we were never asked for our opinion or our thoughts. We just had to carry out uh, uh, these orders. So in conclusion, I wrote, of course, he will have to pay for this with his neck. But what is this one criminal's neck against the suffering and degradation and murder and extermination of two and one half million of his innocent victims? Uh, now, I had one generalization for my generation because I have lived with Quakers in a Quaker community, and they always broadcast, war is not the answer, war is not the answer. Well, maybe a nine-tenths out of wars, war is not the answer. But when you're dealing with people like these Nazi fanatics, I said a few sentences from Rudolf Hirsch's detailed confession should convince anyone who believes that war is not the answer, which may well be true for many wars, that this was not so for World War II. When you are dealing with depraved, ruthless, and vicious human beings, like Hitler, Himmler, Hirsch, and members of the SS and the Gestapo, war is indeed the only answer. So Hess then explained in great detail, which I'm not going to trouble you with, how they killed 10,000 people a day, 10,000 in these uh, gas chambers. They, they deceived them. They told them they had signs there to the showers to, to, uh, you know, to get cleaned up that kind of thing, and the people undressed and went in there willingly, and then they slammed the door, and we said, he said, we turned on the poison gas. So listening to all this was really very difficult for a young person of 22. I was uh, horrified. I was filled with rage and hatred against him and his whole kind. And I can tell you that now I'm reliving it a little bit, but I haven't thought about this, this for many years. Mm -hmm. But it. it they were really dreadful people, and uh, I'm sure Germany is, is well rid of them. And uh, by, I, maybe I have a chance later to say that I'm extremely impressed what the German people have done since World War II, how they you have... You will, but that's well put. Um, okay. each, each of you uh, departed really at the close of the evidence and was back in civilian life, uh, back in France, back in the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the judgments came down. 
Uh, do you remember hearing the verdicts and the, the result of this? No, I had completely forgotten about Nuremberg. <coughs> because I, I, I went to the States as a student, mm -hmm. two years there, and then I joined uh, international organizations. No, perhaps I exaggerate, I exaggerate. No doubt it was in, in the news, mm -hmm. but I didn't sort of follow through with uh, the mm -hmm. little, little work that I had done mm -hmm. there. Okay. Um, Father Fuchs, you were back in Washington, D.C. by the end of September 1946. Oh, by the uh, middle of August. Right. Mm -hmm. And by the middle of September, I was in seminary. I had arranged with my pastor uh, early on, a couple of months before then, at the likelihood, and he had arranged for me to get to a seminary. Uh, Mr. Jackson was going back in August with Elsie Douglas and Bill. Uh, was coming, come back just a couple, couple of weeks later, but he said, long as I'm going, and I know that you are thinking of going to the seminary. So he brought me and one of the drivers, Bob Vlasnik, uh, along with his uh, other officials, we flew by way of Gander uh, back into Washington. Mm -hmm. He was hospitable to the degree they let Bob Blasnick and myself stay at his home in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, met his wife, Irene. We had a nice overnight there before I went to Camp, Danks, Camp Dix. And then uh, I got home on the 15th of August and by the first week of September, I'm in the seminary for So 30 days later, you hear the verdicts uh, that have been rendered here. Uh, how did that seem? How did it feel? How did you the process book was, that? The book was closed. It was all over. Jackson, of course, was persuaded that it would be largely uh, punitive. He was disappointed, I guess, that there was some got away for free, for three of them. But uh, Hallmark shocked. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, do you remember your reactions to the, the yes. verdicts? I was a college student, but I, I heard it was going to be broadcast. It was very early in the morning in New York, five or six, and I got up and I listened to the radio and as they read each name and what the verdict was. And I must say I was very pleased, if anything, I was overjoyed at the verdicts. I've been asked by your newspapers since I'm here whether I thought the trial was fair, and I really thought the trial was very fair particularly the British Chief Justice made a heroic effort to be fair to, to all sides and to give the, the German def witnesses and everything plenty of time to state their case. Mm -hmm. But in answer to your question, when I heard it, I thought 11 were sentenced to death and I think Goering had just committed suicide and uh, seven or eight got long prison sentences. Mm -hmm. um, Hess got life imprisonment, mm -hmm. and I thought as I listened to it, and the three that were acquitted, I had some <laughs> doubts about them, because so they, weren't, the judges. they weren't so, so pure, right. but I think oh, the, I see. Okay. The, so ver the, prosecutors. <laughs> the, ver the verdict said uh, insufficient evidence for conviction, I think that's, right. that's what Let, let me step back, I, mm -hmm. I could not ask a lighter question on the yeah. heels of discussing Rudolf Hirsch. So I wanted to yeah, circle yeah, to the end sure. of the trial. I'm jumping back in now. Uh, give us a, a feel for the, the color or the activity or the distraction or the living in Nuremberg during that year. Uh, my life there was very confined to the driving back and forth six days a week. On occasion, uh, there would be a pre program uh, at the uh, Grand Hotel uh, I had nothing to do with any of the big programs. I would just be uh, on call or right next to the next room when the program was going on. Mm -hmm. But uh, other than an occasional Sunday afternoon uh, in Rothen Rothenburg or one Sunday when we went hunting, Jackson had a few buddies he wanted to go hunting, and uh, it turned out that I was the only one in the party able to shoot a deer, and that Jackson gave some confidence that his bodyguard could shoot well. <laughs> uh, 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 but, the, but Jackson even dressed out the deal. He was, he was, he was a man of ex not only intellectual capacity and educational value and law, but he also was a, a horseman and a farmer, and uh, he wanted to dress out the deer. He said, I'll do it. And he did. So, you know, the whole bit. Okay. He's he well acquainted with all of life. He knew humanity, he experienced it, and uh, he, he expressing what we 
say often of little children, that everybody's aware of what, what is right and wrong. And uh, he wanted to be, in the, as he said in the opening statement, the idea of, uh, that the common humanity has an idea of this is a horrible thing. And he insisted that we have to have the trial in such a way that the world can see uh, fairness can be legislated. Mm -hmm. Eve, what was the, the personal experience of being here like? Not the work, mm -hmm. but the, the, the living and the, uh, the hours for a, a young... Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was very nice. It was okay. a very good job. Uh, because uh, I was with my, my family, uh, uncle and aunt, with the Falco, uh, and they were all, all, all very nice, and mm -hmm. uh, waiting for the next invitation to a cocktail or something like this. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the superficial aspect of it, but uh, every, every morning I went with the bodyguards uh, in a jeep to the mm -hmm. tribunal. U.S. Army bodyguards. Y yes, right, yes. Okay. And uh, in, in, in the palace, it was, it was wonderful in, with comfort, American comfort and efficiency. Uh, that was amazing, mm -hmm. because coming from France, defeated, poor, uh, it, it was such a change. And availability of everything you wanted. You want bananas, you want chocolate, you, you can have it. You didn't have it in France. And it was really coming from a poor, defeated country to abundance and uh, of course selfishly it was uh, very pleasant. The other part of it is that uh, I had very good colleagues about my age or a few years uh, older mm -hmm. and uh, we did a few trips together and worked together. It, it was uh, very, very pleasant in that way, mm -hmm. for, forgetting the dramatic aspect of, uh, of the work. Right. George, your work exposed you to some of the most mm. soul-crushing experiences a person could have. Uh, how did you cope with that? How was the living during your time here in Nuremberg? I think the first month we were quartered at the Grand Hotel, and we felt, of course, very pleased and uh, comfortable there. Mm -hmm. But then more and more VIPs came from Europe and America, and they had priority over us at the Grand Hotel. <clears throat> and we were moved to apartments in the Ulanstrasse, which I would still like to see while I'm here. Mm -hmm. The Grand Hotel is very elegant and lovely. Uh, how did we spend our time? Well, I have to tell you that the citizens of Nuremberg didn't take very long to open up the opera house and the concert hall. And so very soon, I would guess within <coughs> six weeks, we had concerts, we had opera, we had entertainment. And then in addition, uh, I had a German girlfriend, and uh, we went out dancing and... Uh, uh, usually, once I left the courthouse between five and six, whenever that was, you know, I went home for dinner and uh, spent the evening uh, pretty, pretty normally, except wherever we went, we saw those terrible ruins. I have some pictures that I put out here. What, well, you all know what Nuremberg looked like. It, it was absolutely devastated, and it was hard to, to walk around in there or to drive around. And uh, we, we felt sorry for the people who were uh, groveling around in, in their houses looking for a few belongings. I want to ask two final questions of each of you. Um, the first is how the experience here shaped the path you've taken in the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, it didn't, didn't uh, immediately because I had those studies in the U.S. and then work in international organizations as a personnel officer with a little bit of legal uh, mm -hmm. work. And it's only later on, uh, about 40, 40 years afterwards, towards my retirement from World Health Organization, that I started giving lectures, university lectures, mostly in the States, mm -hmm. and about international organization. And, and writing. Uh, and, uh, and of course, and writing first uh, t uh, speeches and uh, international justice. And I rediscovered the Nuremberg. I said, my God, I've been there. So, <laughs> so I can talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote books about not just Nuremberg, but the whole succession of uh, international criminal courts and uh, f five books eventually. So I, I went back deeply into this subject of uh, mm -hmm. fighting impunity. Uh, George, how did it, the experience here connect to your career, your life sense? Well, 
Uh, I was a pre-medical student when I went into the army, and I got more and more interested in psychology and psychiatry because of these, these defendants and what, what makes people do these things, you know, just trying to understand the motivation of these. And so uh, in my junior year in college, I changed my major to psychology and then continued for a master's and a doctorate in clinical psychology because I was so interested in, in this field. And I don't know whether this is the time to give you my two conclusions. Is, is that the, that next, want... the next question, will, next question will be the time for that. Fine, okay. Um, Father Fuchs, uh, it's right there in the appellation and on your collar. Uh, it's obvious you went into the seminary at the end of the summer of 1946 and you've spent your life as a, a Roman Catholic priest. Does the Nuremberg experience connect to the ministry you've pursued? Oh, yes. Uh, I found the Nuremberg trial gave me a lot of hope uh, if you got on the right side. Uh, I, the, it's manifest, obviously, the way the city and the country has grown since we left it. But the, the hope for uh, not just survival, but for thriving in a conviction that good is better than bad, that uh, people are more important than things. I had started out, uh, I was drafted from being a student for mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what I was going to be. I was quite content with that line of thinking. You weren't heading for the seminary before Not you were drafted. Not at all. I had never given it a thought. But during my war experiences, and then capitalized by the experience here at Nuremberg with uh, Mr. Jackson, and also for talking with a couple of chaplains, uh, easy to figure out that people are more important. And what one person can do is so obvious with Jackson as well as with Hitler, depending on which side you want to choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an innate quality draw or hunger for goodness and rightness uh, and fairness, even in little children. And uh, if you can opt, if you get in line with that, then you grow and become in maturity a, a strong person. And I would just and it's been vindicated much more since I've been ordained than the nine years that I had in studies. Each year has begun that right and goodness, honesty, truth is ultimately worthwhile. Be there. And God gives us that insight if you want to pay attention. The very goodness of nature around us and the cycle every year uh, and our awareness of being uh, that, that awareness that nobody else had before our generation, that we live in a blue and white marble in a universe that's beyond our comprehension and that it's cared for in amazing detail. is simply awesome. And that, that, that goodness is worthwhile uh, cultivating. And in fact, I, I, I have a, a perception that uh, the human race on earth is God... Is, is, is God's special cultivation. And as we do in our crops of various sorts, whether animals or plants, God too expects a harvest. He wants people to grow well. This fighting, this international fighting, just as well as personal fighting, uh, is opposite of what God wants to do. He wants us to be peacemakers, mm -hmm. peace workers. George, tell me how you... Think of Nuremberg in summary. What, what does this all mean to you? Well, I, I thought you might ask me that question, so <laughs> I, I wrote down two conclusions, and they may seem obvious to you, but uh, just so that I leave, don't leave out something important, because at my age, my memory is not as good as it used to be. To me, the significance of the Nuremberg trials was that these Nazi leaders were held accountable before a court of law for their war crimes and for their crimes against humanity. They were given lawyers to defend themselves and the time to make their case. Many of them had four, five, six days. And I was besides myself with anger that they allowed Milosevic to talk for three years in the international court. And the entire German government was tried in nine months. But that's another story. So uh, they were given lawyers to defend them and the time to make their case. They were judged by eight distinguished international judges, 
and then the sentences were imposed on them. I think that their fate should serve as a warning to future dictators and tyrants. And my wife and I sometimes have disagreements. She's more pessimistic. She said, well, look at all the things that are going on with uh, people like, like Taylor and Pol Pot and other dictators who don't give a damn. You know, they still go on with on their merry way. But I kind of suspect that there would have been, there would be a lot more of these people if it hadn't been for the Nuremberg trials. So um, I think that that's the, the, the main thing. And the other principle I learned from being a staff member at this trial, and when I lecture to young people about it, as I just did here to one of the high schools, is never appease a dictator. Never allow a dictatorship to take a hold and grow and flourish in or near your country, or for that matter, anywhere in the world. Make sure that you stop the dictatorship early in its tracks, by peaceful means if possible, but by war if necessary. Because, as you all know, I don't have to tell this audience, uh, there were many chances to stop Hitler when he invaded the Rhineland, and he was just beginning to flex his muscles and to defy the Geneva Convention. If they had stopped him early, maybe this whole tragedy could have been prevented. So he said, heute gehört uns Deutschland und morgen die ganze Welt. Today we own Germany, but tomorrow the whole world. So I think wherever possible, we should make use of the United Nations to isolate and stop dictators. And I think that's, that's one of the lessons I, I learned from the trial. Father. Father, you've described very powerfully the, the personal impact on you. How do you think of the significance of Nuremberg for, <coughs> for now and for the future? Uh, it does give us another expression of hope. And it was expressed for me five years ago when we had a similar panel and Arno Humberger reached over as I finished my presentation there about the rule of law is based on the Ten Commandments. And he gave me a very vigorous handshake right behind the other people on the panel there because we have to recognize the basics of right and wrong don't have to be invented all the time. Social interaction between individuals, between groups, between nations depends on rule of law. And of course, it imposes on everybody who has the opportunity to vote, for instance, to make sure that we put in people who make good laws. And we have an obligation to, as you say, go against bad laws and against bad rulers. But the, it's important that we have an awareness that social obligation can culturally, socially workable only if we accept the mature responsibility for choices we make, good or bad, and at least the foreseeable consequences. Thank you. Eve, you've worked in the law, in teaching, uh, in the international uh, organizations community. Um, the thread is very visible as I look at your life from Nuremberg. Um, what does it mean for the future? How do you think of it today? <coughs> well, there's, there's hope and there, is, uh, there are many major problems. <coughs> I thought that uh, things would go and Im Im improving uh, all, all the time. <coughs> I, I fought for the International Criminal Court. I said, it's wonderful, it, it's an achievement. <coughs> While many of my American colleagues said it's nothing, it's, it, it won't work. Uh, it, it works, but uh, with a lot of problems, lots of obstacles. And sometimes when my former students tell me, well, what? I say, maybe it will take 200 years or 500 years or or, or more before it's, it's effective. There is no world government, there is no Ministry of Justice for the world. So it's a utopia in some ways. Uh, Nuremberg started this utopia but doing some good. I think it's good that Taylor is being judged, that Milosevic uh, was about to be uh, sentenced, and the Khmer Rouge, etc. I think that's very good. It's sort of 
part of the, the problem, but you can see, uh, I don't see much preventive effect. Look at all these horrors at the moment, and it sort of goes, goes back to Barbary. So, okay, we can hope, uh, you can be op not optimistic, but realistic that maybe things will, will happen in the future and Nuremberg will still be a, a, a light to, to follow. I hope. Sometimes each of us has the luck to meet an extraordinary teacher or friend or inspiration. Um, and every once in a rare while, you might mean three of them in one occasion. I think tonight has been one of those. Please join me in thanking Eve Begbader, George Sockheim. Oops. Five minutes for questions and comments. You do not. You're done good. Very We're rare. supposed to. We're a good model. We're supposed to step off the stage. Hmm? Off, off the stage. Ich hätte noch stundenlang zuhören können. Ich glaube, Sie auch, meine Damen und Herren. Seien Sie unsere Gäste noch bei einem kleinen Schluck nebenan und einem kleinen Snack. Ich denke, das, was wir jetzt gehört haben, verdient, dass man noch darüber redet. Schön, dass Sie da gewesen sind. Und ein Dank nochmal an die drei jugendlichen <lacht> Diskussionsteilnehmer. <lacht>